Thank you so much. Um, I used to believe that I was driven by the past. I was driven by things outside of my control. I was driven by the family I was born into and the things I had done a few years back. So that was my core belief as a kid. And I think I came by that honestly, okay? So I showed up at Dotson Elementary in New Iberia, Louisiana in 1977, just ready to be a good student. I was cute, I was charming. All the good student stuff, I was compliant. Um, so I was ready to be a good student. And the first question I got you know, I'm thinking uh, they're going to say, do you know your ABCs or, or can you count to 100 um, as a first grader? Um, I said I was ready. I had practiced the answers to those questions. The first question I got from my teachers um, was this. Are you Harry Lopez's little brother? And I was like, yes, I am. I didn't even have to practice that one. Yes, I am. And they said, well, you will be in this class. My brother, fortunately, was incredibly smart. So I was put into this class. Now back in those days, we really didn't hide tracking with names like Blue Jays and Cardinals. I was put in the high class. Friends of mine with not so smart siblings were put in the low class. So they said, you go over there to Miss Davis's class, that's the high class. So this kind of reinforced this belief that, that my life is kind of set, kind of set in stone. You know, I will be judged based on who my brother was and some other variables, maybe even my last name, who knows. Um, then I, you know, I, I took this, this gifted and talented test, didn't even know it was an IQ test. I became an IQ researcher later and really understood all the flaws in testing. And now I know, I thought, I knew, hey, I wasn't placed in GT because my past performance wasn't good enough. Well, finished up at Dotson. I wasn't in gifted and talented or whatever that was called back then. And I went to an all boys middle school. And they put me in gifted and talented. And I said to them, what is this based on? I was just curious the test you took in the fourth grade. I said, well, they didn't put me in gifted and talented there. Yeah, the report suggests that they kind of forgot to mail out the results. So now, more reinforcement. I am now in gifted and talented because of my performance, my past performance two, three years ago, which just happened not to be mailed out to my school. Okay? So I'm really believing that my past is dictating my future. So then, I did well in, in all boys uh, Catholic school, um, but I had an epiphany when I was about 12, 13 years old. There are girls. <laughs> so I switched back to public school, um, did well in public school, um, took the ACT early and did really well in the ACT. I guess I took it maybe the end of my 10th grade year, the beginning of my 11th grade year. I don't know if they even allow that now. Um, and those were the scores. They said, just use those scores when you apply to college. So then I said, why well, do anything my senior year? I'm done. So I did very little my senior year. I did go to both lunches. Um, and my art, teacher, my art teacher caught on the second to last day of school after a whole year of going to both lunches. But I was convinced that my life was driven by who I was a couple of years ago. My future was driven by who I was a couple of years ago and what I could do. And I was convinced that that was true for other people. I went into psychology. I discovered an interesting term. I know it sounds kind of geeky, but someone along the way told me, Shane, all behavior is multiply determined. And I said, tell me more about that. They said, well, whatever outcome in life you're trying to account for, you have to consider a multitude of variables that might contribute to that outcome. And some might be what happened in the past, some might be what happened in the present, and some might be how you think about the future. And then they said, you can use regression equations to figure this out. And I, I was really curious. I said, show me what you mean. I mean, how does this work? But they said, well, you can take someone's past performance in high school, you can take their current IQ, and you can take something like optimism or hope, and then you could better account for outcomes in life 
doing it that way than just doing past performance, present skills, our future thinking. I said, this is amazing. So that's how colleges and graduate schools do it, right? Oh, no. They just look at past performance. <laughs> oh, OK. So I was an intelligence researcher for a while. I figured out that wasn't how I wanted to spend my life. But also during that time, I realized the present isn't the only, the past isn't the only answer to how we end up where we end up. And the current general mental abilities, the present general mental abilities that we have, they don't determine exactly where we end up. So I started getting interested in how we think about the future. And yes, I am a hope researcher, but more generally, I like to think about how we think about the future. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. What I've discovered over time is that investing in the future pays off today. Connie mentioned the work I do across the World Poll and all kinds of other uh, data banks, um, including Gallup Student Poll last uh, year, we measured uh, the hope, engagement, and well-being of almost a half million students. Um, so I can tell you what we know just from studies from the past year. We know that 89% of people on the planet believe the future will be as good or better than the present. 89% of people on the planet are optimistic and optimism is half of hope. We know that half the students in America are hopeful. They believe that the future will be better than the present, and they believe they have some power to make it so. They have some control, small amount of control over their destiny. And we did some meta-analyses, and from that we know that hope is worth a letter grade at school. It's worth a letter grade. So we studied 50 studies that had studied academic outcomes, and we know that hopeful people of, let's say, an IQ of 120 um, and not low hope people of an IQ of 120, um, these folks do a letter grade better than these folks. So even when controlling for those other variables like the past and current mental abilities. We also know that hope is worth a day a week of product productivity on the job. A day a week. A day a week. So a salesperson who's just going big time for a goal, working seven days a week, let's say, for a whole month, she'll sell as much in six days as her counterpart who has low hope will sell in seven days. For you guys who have maybe a flexible schedule, if you go to work at eight and you're high hope, you can take off at about 3.30 and just leave your low hope colleagues to work until 5.30, okay? So that's how that works. But then we realized that hope had a lot to do with well-being. And this is maybe the most exciting discovery of late, that hope is necessary and sufficient for happiness, which helps us be healthy. So hope to happiness to health, this link is what we're currently exploring in some of our modeling work, hope to happiness to health. So those are some of our findings, but what I want to do is get you thinking about what happens before we hope. What happens before you kind of um, set this goal that you're really excited about and start chasing it like a madman or a mad woman? You just really want to get that thing done because that's what hope feels like. What happens before that? I'm going to talk about three different processes that are just fascinating to me and I think they'll interest you that I think we can capitalize on to make sure that our students are investing more deeply psychologically in the future, students of all ages. Now, I came to understand this process by walking my child to school. His name is Parrish. I mention him almost every time I speak, so you get to hear about him, too. Um, he's eight now. When he was three years old, he went to the Clifton Child Development Center in Omaha, Nebraska, the only strengths-based child development center in the world. And we're walking up to school, and he started at age three, he started doing this thing I'll call nexting, nexting. Daddy, when, when next will we go fishing? When's the next time we'll go to a movie? Tell me what we'll do after school. Tell me about the next thing. And he was just always thinking about the future. So I became curious as to how we do that. And I was also, I was convinced that if a three-year-old could do it, many of you in this room could do it, okay? So here's how it happens. Now, I wanted to bring in a functional MRI machine today, but they said that would be too expensive. Um, but work with me here. Hundreds and hundreds of good uh, imaging studies are being done every year 
looking around the world, looking at what the brain does under certain conditions. And we're trying to figure out the brain, map the brain. And one thing that psychologists and neuroscientists have accidentally found, um, one thing they found was that people in the control condition are not behaving in a real passive way. In fact, when they're in a control condition, so we can put you know, people in a tube and say, think about a puppy, and then over here we'll tell you not to think about anything. Okay, just draw your mind blank and, and don't think about anything. And over here you'll think about the puppy and all kinds of positive emotion things will pop up unless you were at some time accosted by a puppy. And um, in this condition, you're supposed to be at rest, and you are. And when you're at rest, when you're in the control condition, guess what you're doing? Thinking about the future. In almost every participant, it's not some, it's not most, in almost every participant, you're in the tube, you're at rest. The default mode of the brain is to think about the future. So now neuroscientists are culling the data from the people in the control conditions, right? It's like we were always comparing what they were doing to these other folks and saying, okay, they're at rest, they're doing nothing essentially. And in fact, they were thinking about the future. They were daydreaming. They were envisioning possibilities. It might have been dinner, it might have been, oh, I want to be a rock star, it might have been, oh, I want to find the love of my life, but they were thinking about the future. So what I want you to know the first thing I want you to know is that humans, our natural state, is thinking about the future. And believe me, I, I practice something called loving kindness meditation. I love being perfectly in the present. Love it. I also think quite a bit about the past. And the nostalgia is kind of a hot research topic right now, and I learn from the past. But our natural state may be thinking about the future. So I'll ask you this. How often do you let your students be in their natural state? How often did you give them the time and the space and the conditions to be in their natural state and to daydream and to envision the future and to just have some whimsical thoughts? So that's the first thing that fascinates me is that's our natural state. The second thing, I just get all giddy when I talk about it, Okay, we're out the tube, don't worry about the functional MRI anymore. But all the time when we're thinking about the future, we're creating memories of the future. Some memory researchers are abandoning their, their research on, oh, what does a past memory have to do with current life and what does a past memory do to our emotions? And they're starting to study how do memories of the future affect our lives today? How does our simulation of the future affect how we live our lives today. And I just, that just blows me away. Our minds are creating memories of the frickin' future. I mean, that's like, wow. And we can only get to that place if we have the right conditions to be in our natural state. And then we move into that place where we're creating memories of the future. So that's the second thing I want you to think about is how are you encouraging your students, your colleagues, your coworkers, your teachers to create memories of the future? So are you giving them that space to daydream? That's number one. But number two, are you challenging them to think about the future in more complex ways? Are you asking them to really tell stories about their future? Because they're already doing it internally. Are you asking them to share those out loud? Now, I want to tell you about the industry that's, that's right on top of this and that's the financial management industry. Financial services are very invested in how you think about the future. You can kind of do your own little study. You can look at prudential ads, principal ads. Um, all of these groups are focused on you thinking about the future. The current prudential ad has a psychologist named Daniel Gilbert, and he's standing in front of this big billboard in Austin. Uh, people showed up and said, he said to them, how, what's the, the age of the oldest person you know personally. And then they put these big dots on the billboard and it, he found out that a lot of people know people 100, 101 years old. And then he'll ask these people of varying ages, he said, are you saving for retirement? 
well enough to support you when you're 101? And they're like, whoa. Whoa. Because you know people who are currently 101. You're 40 something years of age now. Medicine will improve. You probably need money until you're 100. That's what financial services is doing. What is education doing? What is education doing to project people into the future, to get them to create these memories of the future so that they can get busy today on saving the right amount, borrowing the right amount, figuring out what they need from college, figuring out what they need from high school. So I think we can improve the simulation process. These kids today, they have this little device, I don't know if you've heard of it, called a smartphone, all right? And they, they take pictures. They take pictures. And what principal does is principal challenges all of their clients to go out and take pictures of their future and create a collage in this device called a dream catcher, create a collage of what they want their retirement to look like. What if we asked our students to go out and take pictures of what they want their future jobs to look like, their future relationships, their future homes? And what if they came back and just like with financial planners, we would have to say, well, I don't think everybody can afford a big yacht. So let's kind of scale that back and talk about that. We would have the ability to do, to help them do the third thing that they do naturally. They edit and design the future. They design and edit the future. Now much of our talk today has focused on the changing economy, the changing world. In this changing world, here's what we're asking people to do. To design and build their own jobs and lives. We're asking them to design and build their own jobs and lives. If you think about everything we talked about, we're basically saying we need critical thinking, great writing, we need students to have these, these adaptability skills because there's not gonna be that traditional job waiting for them. They're gonna to have to design and build it. And then along the way, they're gonna to have to build their bigger, broader lives in a newer, more complex arena. We need to help students edit those pictures edit those pictures. We need to have critical conversations about those images of the future. So again, to repeat, number one, thinking about the future is our natural state of being. We need to help students achieve that natural state more often. Number two, um, we create these memories of the future and we need to nudge folks to do more of that and actually learn what those memories are all about have them tell stories to us in all different forms about those memories. And then finally, we need them to sort and edit down those memories so that they can start designing and building their lives. Designing and building their lives. Now we're finally at, back to hope. Only then can a student say, I'm ready to set a goal. I'm ready to set a big bad goal for my career, for my life, because I have imagined the future. I have sorted through these mental images that I created in my own mind, and now I know emotionally and rationally which ones I can pull off and which ones excite me. Those are the images I'm investing in. Those are my hopes for the future. Now, when we've asked people around the world, including students, what are your hopes and dreams for the future? We get this wonderful bevy of responses, and um, we then take all of those open-ended responses to these amazing folks at Gallup, um, and they code the responses. They reduce all those responses down to just a handful of words. And the one finding, you know, and this is, um, you know, this is not modeling, statistical modeling. This is in imperfect science that I'm about to tell you about, but I really think it's it's a finding that. Um, could drive a lot of what we do in education. So I want you to, to really think about it hard. Once we take all those words, there are two that are almost always in the top five around the world, no matter of age. And I think there's something we really need to think about. What are your hopes and dreams for the future, for your life? The two that I'm gonna focus on today, a good job and a happy family. A good job and a happy family. Now I'm going back to my belief that uh, you know, my life was basically um, determined by my past and variables I couldn't control. Guess how many times someone asked me, Shane, what do you wanna do when you grow up from the age of zero to 18? Never. 
Shane, you, you don't remember things well. Remember that partying in college? That erased all your memories. I was waiting, starting at about age 11, I was waiting for someone to ask me. I really wanted someone to ask me. In school or at home in the neighborhood, I wanted someone to ask me. No one ever asked me. No one ever invested in my psychological picture of the future. And I would have told them, at 13 I would have said, you know, I want to become a podiatrist um, and I want a happy family. I want to fall in love and I want to have a happy little family, a little bit better and different from the family I came from. Um, then I saw old people's feet and I changed my mind to become a psychologist. That's how rational, that's how rational this all is. If I would have seen some beautiful old people feet, I wouldn't be here right now. Okay, so I can't end on old people feet. Um, good job and happy family. So people ask me, Shane, how do we boost hope in America? How do we boost hope in schools? How do we boost hope around the world? Two things. You have to help someone chase a goal they're excited about. I didn't say set a goal they're excited about. You have to help someone chase a goal that they're excited about so they can feel physically, kinesthetically, emotionally what that's like. And you have to help them do that. And then you have to encourage them to spend time with the most hopeful person in their lives. The most hopeful person in their lives. You all have to be those people to many, to your coworkers, to your family, to your friends, to your students. Thank you so much.